This panel is on historical lessons or case studies that can inform our views about um, how to solve the North Korea problem. Um, first up is Jonathan Pollack. He's the senior fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy at the Brookings Institution and one of my favorite colleagues at Brookings. We have Michael Dobbs, author of the Cold War Trilogy, who is uniquely qualified to tell the story of the defining ideological contest of the contest of the 20th century. Jake Sullivan is the Martin R. Flug um, visiting lecturer in law at Yale, Yale Law School. And he served in the Obama administration as the national security advisor to Vice President Joe Biden and director of policy planning at the US Department of State. And finally, David Cohen, um, my former boss, uh, who's a partner of Wilmer Hale, um, and, and uh, was the de deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Well, he, well, he helped to manage the agency's domestic and worldwide operations, oversee its strategic modernization, and lead foreign intelligence collection, all source analysis, covert action, counterintelligence, and foreign liaison relationships. Each panelist um, will have five minutes to make remarks. Uh, and following all presentations, the panelists will answer questions from the audience, and I'll be moderating this panel. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, John. Uh, am I on? Uh, am I on? I'm on. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, I've been asked to make a few comments on the experiences uh, that um, we have had, the United States in particular has had, uh, in periodic negotiations with North Korea, and what uh, lessons derived from that experience uh, will or would or would not instruct us if, under some hypothetical future, we were enter, enter uh, negotiations with them uh, as, uh, yet again. Um, this has been a very episodic process, to say the least. Um, no American officials uh, interacted uh, with North Korean counterparts until uh, the late Arne Cantor uh, met with a senior uh, North Korean official in 1991. Uh, and of course, there's been, since then, uh, periodic efforts uh, to uh, negotiate with North Korea, come to understandings, most, most of them, of course, reflecting uh, the question of the status of the nuclear weapons uh, program. Um, and the, a cynical observation might be that negotiations can work with North Korea until they no longer work. Uh, and the question would be is what, what drives that process where there seems to be at various moments in time a degree of forward movement uh, until the process comes to a halt. And there are multiple example, examples of this. Uh, two or three things uh, bear on this. Um, one is that it may be that at the end of the day, the North Korean elites or those responsible for the formulation of North Korean strategy really know what their red lines are, maybe better than others. Uh, in other words, things that you cannot overcome, places you cannot go, things you cannot do. Much of this, of, of course, historically has focused on issues of verification uh, related both to nuclear weapons uh, and other capabilities. Uh, and that's been a persistent problem going back to the time that Hans Blix first entered North Korea uh, for the International Atomic Energy Agency in the early, in the early 1990s. Um, so, if we if we look at that as a as as a relevant guide, we can ask, what is it that denies the possibility for going beyond? Is it simply a question of what you are trying to hide? Is it a question of a profound distrust that exists? Let's remember uh, that um, North Korea uh, under Kim Il Sung, uh, when Kim Il Sung in 1957, uh, he made a request of Mao Zedong. Uh, and he asked for all remaining Chinese personnel, military personnel and government, you know, and other kinds of uh, uh, economic personnel alike, to be withdrawn from North Korea. And they were. Mao honored that agreement. That was in October of 1958. And it is my argument that there has been no sustained 
meaningful foreign presence of any country in North Korea now for 60 years. Uh, I dare say that's part of the secret of what I will advisedly call North Korea's success. If the question here is simply the capacity to deny external influence into the system uh, with all the unpredictable consequences that could ensue. Um, now, we can say that uh, from the point of view of the United States, uh, negotiations uh, do indeed at times buy time, uh, although we could ask time for what. Uh, this is something that I know some of the people in the audience here uh, have grappled with in their own, uh, in their own experiences. Um, but what we see at present, I think, uh, is that there, there's a new context. The context here are the heightened risks of, of military conflict uh, that are all too evident, at least in public chatter. Whether that reflects the realities behind the scenes, we don't know. Uh, it also bears consideration that all these negotiations have been with a remarkably small number of individuals in the North. So in some sense, when we have negotiated start, uh, successfully or not with North Korea, there's the question of how representative are these individuals? They come mainly, of course, from the foreign ministry. Uh, but the access into the, dare I call it, the North Korean deep state uh, is uh, much more problematic. Uh, and that is what has stymied us at regular, at regular intervals in dealing with the North. Um, so, um, uh, I don't want to, there's not time to go through all the historical episodes, uh, but it, it, it's striking to me nonetheless that at different critical junctures, when the door has opened to possibilities, and I, for example, if we think very, back to the very end of the George W. Bush administration, uh, the Bush administration was prepared to make concessions of an extraordinary sort to North Korea. Um, well, I mean, we understand this uh, to some extent from the historical record. Some have written about it. Uh, but at that very moment, North Korea balked. Curiously enough, this coincides with the period where Kim Jong-il was in extraordinarily problematic health. He had had a stroke in 2008. Uh, and essentially, these conditions, except for that time early in the Obama administration, when uh, the president uh, certainly tried to see where there was negotiation possible with North Korea, it's been pretty much shut down ever since. Uh, and we can ask questions why. It does coincide, then, with the ascendance of Kim Jong-un. Um, we have to ask and reflect about this as we now approach this new period of time where there are certainly many, of, many voices claiming we should be negotiating with the North, or at least talking to the North, we ought to be asking ourselves, what is it that we expect to be an outcome from there? Do we even know exactly what it is we, we would want from this process? And what kinds of guarantees would there be? So I look at this, uh, given this problematic record, and it's one of the things that makes me uh, rather cautionary about what the possibilities would be here, um, even as we confront the new realities of a now much more nuclear-armed state. Uh, does North Korea really seek a negotiation here? And toward what end? Uh, those are questions I think we ought to be asking ourselves. We ought to look before we leap. Uh, and uh, and uh, that may be certainly preferable to something that induces a major crisis. But uh, we have to examine these historical cases very, very carefully, lest we overinvest in that process when the results have proven um, so, shall we say, spotty. I think I'll, I'll end there and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, just to introduce myself, um, I was a former Washington Post reporter. I cover, spent a lot of my career covering the collapse of communism. I uh, was in Russia. Uh, when the system collapsed. And when I came back, I wanted to write about Cold War, the course of the Cold War. I wrote a book called One Minute to Midnight, uh, which was about the peak of the Cold War, the most dangerous moments in the Cold War. And I'd like to share some of my uh, conclusions uh, in researching and writing that book, uh, which may uh, resonate with you as we think about 
the risks that we're running uh, with North Korea. My number one conclusion is that the real danger of war in October 1962 came not from the conscious decisions and actions of the three key players, Khrushchev, Kennedy, and Castro, but from miscommunications, uh, misunderstandings, and mistakes at all levels, not only um, of the leaders, but also lower down the chains of command. Um, the most famous book about the Cuban Missile Crisis is probably Essence of Decision by Graham Allison, in which he talks about the rational actor model, as he described it. When I did my research, what really struck me was not the rational actor, but the irrational actor. And by irrational actor, I don't mean only the irrational leaders, but um, irrational actors at much lower level. Um, and this is exemplified for me, the kind of risk we ran is exemplified for me by a story of something, an incident uh, on October 27th, 1962, which is probably the most dangerous day of the missile crisis. It was called Black Saturday, when um, uh, there was a U-2 was shot down over Cuba. Uh, we, uh, the Strategic Air Command got to DEFCON 2, and at that precise moment, a, in a completely unrelated incident, a U-2 stationed in Alaska uh, flies to the North Pole to conduct an air sampling mission, um, atomic air sampling mission, and by mistake, takes a wrong turn over the North Pole, and instead of coming back to Alaska, ends up over the Chukotka Peninsula on the most dangerous day of the Cold War. Uh, the Soviets send up MiG fighters to try to get it down. Uh, plane runs out of um, runs out of fuel over the Chukot Peninsula. Miraculously, makes it back to um, to Alaska. And uh, JFK says, "There's always some son of a bitch that doesn't get the word." <laughs> and uh, that, to me, some son of a bitch. We can imagine that kind of incident happening in the case of North Korea. Second lesson, um, the key role uh, that is played by a president that nobody else can play. Um, we hear a lot today about all these uh, wise people surrounding the president, but if you study the XCOM meetings uh, in October 1962, um, in many cases, or in several key moments, it was uh, one man against the rest of the XCOM, and decisions were taken by a minority of one. It was only one person in that room, in the cabinet room of the White House, who had the broader view. He was not just interested in his department or how we would defend NATO. He was answerable not only to Americans, but also to future generations, and that was JFK. He also happened to understand uh, the risks that I talked about, uh, the risk of an accidental nuclear war. He had had experience in World War II himself. His brother had been killed in World War II, and in this he shared something with the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, who had also gone through uh, World War II. Third lesson. Uh, it helps when this president has a sense of history. Um, JFK had, just shortly before uh, the missile crisis, he'd read a book called The Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman, which deals with the origins of the First World War. And that book was very much on his mind in uh, the way he approached the missile crisis. He kept on asking himself, you know, in 1914, the world stumbled into war without anybody really knowing the reason why and that if we were going to get into a war in October 1962, Kennedy wanted to know the reason why. And he kept on asking that question. And although history never repeats itself exactly, uh, there are lessons to be drawn from history. And uh, Kennedy, um, both because he had experienced history himself as a soldier in World War, in, in, in war, uh, 
but also because he'd made a study of history, he was well placed to answer that kind of questions. Um, lesson number four. Uh, what we conventionally think about of military superiority has very little meaning in the nuclear age. Um, in 1962, the United States had overwhelming nuclear superiority over the Soviet Union um, by numerical figures, you know, four or five times as many uh, US missiles could hit the Soviet ter territory as vice versa. Uh, and the qualitative dif difference was even uh, greater. Um, but this meant very little to JFK. During the crisis, he asked two uh, most very important questions. First of all, he said, when they were considering an airstrike over Cuba, uh, airstrikes over Cuba to take out the missile sites, he said to the uh, commander of the, uh, the tactical uh, air command, can we get all the missile sites that we've identified, all the missiles, or all the missiles that exist in Cuba? And the answer was, uh, we think so, Mr. President, but we can't absolutely be sure. That was a very sobering answer for JFK. And the other question uh, that JFK asked was, what happens if even one of those missiles hits the United States? And uh, the answer was, well, perhaps 500, 600,000 Americans might be killed. And Kennedy said, well, that's more than the number of Americans who died in the entire Civil War. That was unacceptable to him. And he later said that, you know, despite the military superiority that we enjoyed over the Soviet Union, uh, Ken, uh, Khrushchev uh, had sufficient deterrent uh, to prevent uh, Kennedy from thinking about a first nuclear strike against the Soviet Union. Fifth lesson, uh, we've heard a lot about the madman card. The madman card is really a weapon of the weak against the strong. And in the missile crisis, the madman card was played by Fidel Castro. The slogan of the Cuban Revolution is patria o muerte, fatherland or death. Um, and the ability to use the madman card effectively depends on whether you can convey that you really are suicidal. And it's difficult for the president of a, the richest country, most powerful country in the world to do that because powerful countries have more to lose than poor um, uh, relatively powerless countries. So be careful how you use the madman card. Uh, lesson number six, danger of red lines. Kennedy had drawn a red line about uh, Soviet sending offensive uh, weapons to Cuba, and he later came to regret that because he discovered that it uh, boxed, boxed him in. Uh, final lesson, um, the lack of knowledge about the other side. Uh, when I researched the crisis, and I, now it's possible to get, gain access pretty much to uh, all uh, US intelligence uh, material, uh, of the uh, intelligence gathering of the crisis, the raw intelligence gathering. And there are some, many things that we did know, including the location of the sites, but there were many things that the CIA was unable to, uh, to tell Kennedy. They didn't know about the number of Soviet troops in Cuba. They told him that there were seven or 8,000 Soviet troops. There were 42,000 Soviet troops. They didn't know, he kept on asking about the location of the warheads. We knew where the, um, where the missile sites were, but we didn't know where the nuclear warheads were. We only found that out about that many years later. They didn't know about the presence of tactical nuclear weapons on, on Cuba. They didn't know about the uh, Soviet plans to destroy Guantanamo in the event of a uh, Soviet, uh, US invasion of, uh, of Cuba. And probably the biggest unknown was the intentions of the other side. They didn't know why, but they misunderstood why, the reasons why uh, Khrushchev had sent missiles to Cuba in the first place. They saw, thought it was about uh, the, something about the balance of power when it was actually more to do with defending the Cuban Revolution. Uh, so there was a lot they didn't know.
Now, the real question in the Cuban Missile Crisis was whether rational actors uh, can impose their will on the irrational ones. And by the rational actors, in the case of the crisis, I mean Kennedy and Khrushchev. Um, they ended up actually pretty much on the same side um, against the irrational actor, the man who was playing the madman card, Fidel Castro. They decided that, this, that the risk of escalation was too great and uh, the crisis had to be brought to an end somehow, which is why Kennedy sent his brother Robert to the Soviet embassy in Washington on the night of October 27th. Uh, and they jointly brought an end to the crisis. Now, in the North Korea crisis, you have uh, three sides as well, United States, North Korea, and China. But the configuration is very different. Um, we don't know who the rational actors are and who are the irrational ones. Um, so those are my lessons. Thank you. Thank you. I had the privilege of working with, uh, oh, hello? Okay, cool. <laughs> he was cutting me off before I said I had the privilege of working with him. He was always <laughs> fiddling with my microphones. Um, uh, with David Cohen uh, and others here, uh, including Abriel, who we'll hear from later, um, on a range of different issues, uh, among them, of course, the North Korea issue, but also uh, what I've come here today to talk about, which is lessons from the uh, Iran nuclear diplomacy uh, that could potentially be relevant for what is a significantly different context, but obviously there are some clear parallels. And I guess I would start by saying that if you work hard, uh, this is to the future negotiator of the North Korean nuclear deal, that if you work hard and you produce the deal, you too can wait with bated breath about whether a future president will ultimately walk away from it, as we're doing this week uh, with the Iran nuclear deal. Um, that was meant as a joke, kind of, I don't know. Uh, although it's not really a laughing matter. Um, you know, the first thing that strikes me about uh, the nuclear diplomacy with Iran, and I was involved in the, the initial establishment of the discrete channel in Oman that led to the interim deal and ultimately paved the way for the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, is that while we spent hours, days, weeks, years in the room with the Iranians and with our negotiating partners, most of the negotiations were shaped by activities that took place outside of the negotiating room. And uh, the nature of U.S. strategy towards Iran and the Obama administration was a, I think, a remarkably singular whole-of-government approach that was multidimensional, that was the president's top priority, that was driven by the National Security Advisor, bought into by all of the principles, and executed up and down the government. So whether you're talking about sanctions, which David will get into, intelligence-led activities, force posture, alliance coordination, diplomatic options, uh, Tom Donilon uh, and Susan Rice put enormous attention and effort into running a whole-of-government gover operation to shape the overall environment and ultimately to shape Iran's choices. And as I look at the way that North Korea policy has been conducted thus far over the course of the past few months, of course, from the outside, you can't see everything. But I think this administration could learn lessons from the op-tempo, the intensity, uh, and the interdisciplinary nature of the strategy that, that the Obama administration pulled together that ultimately created the conditions under which you could have successful diplomacy. It's interesting that at this point it always seemed clear that the Iranians would be prepared to put on the table their nuclear program um, and you know, reach a deal that involves some pretty severe restraints. But in, in the early years of the Obama administration in dealing with the Ahmadinejad government, even in the P5 plus one process, their notion of what a nuclear deal would look like wasn't even in the same sport, let alone the same ballpark as what was ultimately required and ultimately produced. They were not thinking by any means of reducing the number of centrifuges or dealing with their plutonium reactor or dramatically expanding inspection. So there had to be uh, steps taken and economic pressure was a central part of it 
to change their calculus as to what they were going to have to put on the table and ultimately deal with. And that leads me to the second lesson, which is about leverage. Um, you know, obviously, we sought to build up leverage that we could then convert into diplomatic results at the, at the negotiating table. And um, a core part of that leverage was this global sanctions regime uh, that we built and then carefully tended. And I'm not going to go into detail on this because David can speak about it with much greater uh, authority and specificity. But I would say that we did rely on two factors of the Iranian economy in building this leverage. The first is that it was relatively exposed to the international community. And part of what we accomplished was reducing their oil exports from two and a half million barrels a day to one million barrels a day, which had a dramatic impact on their economy. And of course, freezing their assets, which were being held overseas, both in connection with oil exports and other exports of the Iranian economy. So this was an exposed economy, and not just exposed in one place, but in Europe, in China, in Japan, in Korea, in South Africa, in India, and other places. <clears throat> the, the situation with North Korea is somewhat different, as David will get into. They are exposed, but they're basically exposed to one country, uh, China, where they do 85 to 90 percent of their trade. So it creates a different set of calculations, but fundamentally figuring out where that exposure is and how to attack it is a critical part of building the economic leverage. The second is that we recognized that in Iran's case, they had to be at least somewhat responsive to uh, their population, to a sense of economic dislocation and disempowerment among the Iranian population that mattered from the point of view of regime stability over time. They cared about discontent in the street. They worried about how to create outlets for pressure. And ultimately, Rouhani's election in 2013 was about a response to the economic hardship that had been imposed over the course of several years of growing sanctions against Iran. The question is, uh, is North Korea similarly responsive? I think we heard from the earlier panel, and we can assess certainly not in the same way that Iran is. And so the power to withstand economic pressure, even if you can crank it up via the route of China, may be different in the, in the North Korea case than in the Iran case. One of the things that doesn't get talked about as much uh, in the overall strategy towards Iran was the credible threat of military force. And it came into play, I think, in two important respects. The first is that the credible threat of military force, whether by the Israelis or by the Americans, had an impact on the rest of the world agreeing to, go, to forego some of their own economic benefits from trading with Iran and signing up to the global sanctions. When Secretary Clinton and others were going around the world basically building this coalition, uh, when David would show up in capitals around the world, one of the things that they could credibly say was, if we don't figure out a diplomatic solution that we will arrive at through the application of economic pressure, we may end up in a circumstance where either the Israelis take a strike or the United States has no choice but to take a strike. That had a meaningful impact on people signing up to this global campaign of economic pressure. Similarly, the possibility that Iran would face a military action, I think, had a meaningful impact on their own capability clock, on the speed with which they were prepared to advance their program. And they were careful not to move too far too fast because they didn't want to take some kind of precipitous step forward that might trigger a military response. So I think it had some deterrent effect on the Iranians as well. And that is important because, as David knows better than anyone, sanctions are not a fast-moving tool. And so slowing the capability clock was important to give time and space for the sanctions to be able to work effectively in the Iran context. And uh, you know, we knew that we could, in fact, pursue a credible threat of military force because, first, we had a good sense of where the major Iranian nuclear facilities were. Query whether that's the case with respect to the broader nuclear complex in North Korea. And second, uh, we did not have to worry about the level of catastrophe that would be present in terms of a North Korean response against Seoul or, or otherwise. Obviously, Iran would have some capability to respond to an attack, 
but a much more limited capability given their place in the neighborhood, what they possessed, and what we and our partners could respond with. And so that threat had a, a level of credibility that uh, query whether the same is present in the North Korea context. We've heard, uh, I think, over the course of today, and many people in this room um, know from you know, their own independent analysis that Kim Jong-un doesn't look like he's in, in much of a mood right now to get involved in a meaningful negotiation. And so lessons about the precise parameters of a negotiation and so forth may not be all that relevant. But what I will say is that having a dedicated bilateral channel that is discreet, that is hidden from view, uh, was a central feature of our being able to reach a successful outcome with Iran. If this had simply been done through the P5 plus one process or through a six-party talk process uh, as the analog in North Korea, I don't think we would ever, ever have reached the outcome we reached. We needed a dedicated space to have the, the conversation, to make the trade-offs, to table the proposals, and I think the same thing would hold true in the context with North Korea. And I know that over the course of years, we've tried to think about ways to maintain some contact with the North Koreans privately, discreetly, quietly, building those channels, those contacts up into something that looks more like a negotiation over time is something that you know we've got to try to stick with, even if the odds seem incredibly long at the moment because any successful negotiation will emanate from that kind of channel to a greater extent than some public formal set of negotiations. The final thing that I would say is that all of the major powers of the world in the case of Iran were united on one side of the negotiating table with Iran on the other side of the negotiating table. And what was interesting about that was uh, it took a certain number of chairs to actually seat all of the P5 plus one representatives because you had uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany plus the EU. That's a bunch of people. The Iranians insisted on an identical number of seats on their side of the table and had to go find bodies, their drivers and so forth, to fill them. But this was a negotiation set up with the world on one side and Iran on the other side. One of the interesting dynamics in the North Korea negotiation, and Michael referred to this as a three-sided negotiation, that the Chinese, it's not the US and China and the rest of the world on one side of the table and North Korea on the other side of the table. That is part of the challenge. Now, there's a reason for that related to China and North Korea's unique historical relationship, but I think part of the long-term diplomatic strategy cannot just be about going after the Chinese on more pressure to set up a US-North Korea negotiation. It should be to shift the Chinese orientation so that they feel some responsibility as a regional power, as a player with global uh, responsibilities, to actually fulfill the North Korean paranoia we heard about on the panel before, that now they, North Korea, in a sense, has to shift from being their client or someone where they're the broker between the US on one hand and, and, and North Korea on the other hand to being a problem they need to help solve. I don't think that that kind of adjustment is going to happen in the near term, but I think there are seeds that have been planted to that effect within the, the psychology of some of the leaders in China and that this has to be a shift that we have to push for over time because as long as we remain in this three-sided negotiation, I think, uh, our capacity to be able to effectively shape the environment and shape the North Koreans' calculus will be inhibited and, and we will not be able to make the same kind of progress we were able to make with Iran. So those are some thoughts from the, uh, the Iran experience that uh, may prove useful if ever we do get back to the table with North Korea. So thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It is on. And it's great to work with Jake um, uh, here. It was great to work with Jake and, uh, in this Iran deal with a real and uh, with the whole, the whole team. Um, so as, as Young mentioned, I was most recently the deputy director of the CIA. Before that, I was the undersecretary of Treasury for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, which is a 
a mouthful of a title, but basically I got to oversee uh, all of our sanctions efforts, including the sanctions that, uh, that Jake was referencing, uh, that built up over time, uh, creating the leverage for the Iran negotiations, also the North Korea sanctions, Russia, Russia sanctions, what have you. So my, uh, my comments this morning are gonna be focused on the, the role of sanctions uh, historically and how they can be uh, a part of the effort going forward uh, with North Korea. Uh, so first, I think it's important to recognize that sanctions can serve three purposes and possibly a fourth. The, the three, which I think are familiar uh, to most, is the, number one, you know, sanctions are essential to reinforce international law, essentially. You know, in a series of Security Council resolutions, whether you're talking about Iran or North Korea, the Security Council has made clear that the, the testing, uh, the development of a nuclear program is unlawful. Security Council has demanded that North Korea return to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so following through on sanctions is a way of putting some reinforcement uh, in that international law obligation on North Korea. Secondly, sanctions can impede progress, particularly targeted sanctions that are aimed at those entities both inside a country and outside the country that are essential for uh, helping to develop the nuclear program, the ballistic missile program. And so in the Iran context, we spent uh, a lot of time over many years identifying the brokers, identifying the businesses, identifying those actors outside of Iran who were providing essential ingredients to the Iranian nuclear program and its ballistic missile program. That is still going on, I should note, with respect to the ballistic missile program. Um, frankly, it's a part of also the, the deal to keep an eye on that for the nuclear program. In North Korea, the same thing. We are, uh, you know, have been and are continuing to focus on those external actors that support the, the North Korean program, uh, both by going after the financial institutions and the businesses that are supplying material, as well as trying to take out of international commerce by designations the, the North Korean entities. That's not gonna stop the program. It didn't stop Iran's program. It won't stop North Korea's program, but it does impede progress, it does create time and space for other efforts to, to proceed. The third objective of sanctions is to create leverage. As, as Jake noted, the effort in Iran to ramp up the sanctions over time and to move from these targeted sanctions that impede the program to much more broad-based sanctions that really took a toll on the Iranian economy. Um, that created important leverage and, frankly, trade uh, currency for, for the deal. And you know, Jay can speak to this as he was uh, you know, involved in the discrete channel in these negotiations, but the, the Iranians were, you know, as Jake noted, not that interested in negotiations for a long time. And we were talking, I don't know if we were talking or negotiating or somewhere in between uh, for some period of time, but it wasn't until the fall of 2013 when the Iranian rial basically fell off a cliff um, because of the oil sanctions that have been put in place, because of the, the additional sanctions that we put in place to essentially deprive Iran of access to the revenue that it was earning from the reduced oil sales that it was uh, able to make, that's when the Iranians were really became serious about the negotiations. That sort of leverage uh, you know, can be created by sanctions. The fourth way in which sanctions can be useful, um, and I say can be because I, I think this is a debatable point, but it's important to, to think about, is to foment unrest internally in a country. Um, you know, as Jake noted, the Iranians were concerned about the street, they were concerned about losing control of their population. That created some leverage for the negotiations, but there was also a theory that had we continued with the sanctions and even ramped them up further, that it could have created the conditions for uh, 
some internal uh, efforts to oust the regime. Um, and I think in North Korea, um, you know, we were, the last panel was talking about the role of the elites and how Kim Jong-un is able to keep the elites on side. I think there is a question that's worth talking about, uh, about whether a significantly torqued up sanctions program that deprives North Korea and deprives Kim Jong-un of the ability to buy off the elites and makes the elites feel that you know, their you know, little hold on a decent life in North Korea as they look around the rest of the country and realize that, the, that everyone else is living in great deprivation, uh, that that, uh, that is at risk uh, if the nuclear program, ballistic missile program continues. And sanctions, particularly really intensive sanctions, I think can, uh, at least theoretically, uh, play into that. At a minimum, it creates additional leverage. I would say, um, the second point, that I, I think that the Trump administration uh, has taken some important steps to create the leverage uh, that might be necessary uh, to get a good negotiation going. You know, I, at, I, I was you know, frequently at events like this would, would say, you know, going back you know, six, nine months ago, that the idea that North Korea was sanctioned out uh, or that sanctions won't work on North Korea was wrong. Um, you know, it was, in fact, the case that we had a much less intensive sanctions program focused on North Korea than we had had on Iran, or for that matter, on many other of our sanctions targets for many years. Even as we were ramping up our sanctions on North Korea, it still hadn't reached anywhere close to the level that we had with Iran. I think that is no longer uh, the case. Um, and I would just cite a couple of things here. The Security Council resolution from over the summer that took aim at North Korea's ability to export coal. That will take off about a billion dollars of Korean, uh, of North Korean uh, revenue. And now, mind you, the North Korean economy is about the size of Dayton, Ohio's economy, um, just by you know, sort of you know, analogy. It's about a four or five billion dollar economy. You take off a billion dollars of their revenue, that's a significant impact. Um, the, the second really important step was the executive order that was issued uh, last month, in the middle of September, that, that wasn't the first foray into secondary sanctions, but was a really significant step up of the secondary sanctions aimed at North Korea. And what this, essentially what this executive order did was through the threat of cutting off financial institutions that trade with North Korea in any goods. It doesn't have to be in illicit goods, it doesn't have to be in something for the nuclear program, the illicit missile program, but any trade with North Korea that any financial institution facilitates, that financial institution can be cut off from the US. That is an extraordinarily powerful secondary sanctions tool. It is essentially imposing a worldwide trade embargo on North Korea. Because any bank that wants to be able to operate internationally needs to have access to the US financial system. If that bank, any bank, helps facilitate either an import or export, significant import or export into North Korea, they can be cut off from the US. That is a, is a powerful, powerful tool. And you know, I think over time, we will see having a real impact on North Korea. The other part of this that the, the Trump administration has taken on is to try to change the Chinese calculus. So over the summer, there was an action taken against a bank called the Bank of Dandong uh, in China, which had been facilitating a fair amount of, of uh, economic activity with North Korea. And you know that was a a, I think a shot across the bow to China saying we are prepared to put at risk your financial institutions if you don't you know, sort of come on side on this three part, you know, three dimensional negotiation and come over to our side a little bit uh, in, in the effort with North Korea. And then again, this executive order uh, by targeting financial institutions anywhere that facilitate trade, given that 
about 90 percent of all of North Korea's trade goes through China, it is effectively another uh, sort of warning shot at China that their financial institutions are at risk. And you can see the Chinese recognize that because at the same time that we announced this executive order, the Chinese central bank sent out notice to their financial institutions telling them to draw down their accounts with North Korea and not to take on any new North Korean accounts. They're trying to protect their financial institutions from the threat that they will be targeted by the U.S. The final two points I will make um, very quickly are, number one, sanctions take time to work. Um, we have an impatience here. I think you can see this uh, in some of the president's tweets uh, that this problem needs to get solved immediately. Sanctions won't solve this problem immediately. They take time to, to have an effect, and the steps that have been taken over the last six months or so to increase the pressure, that will manifest over you know, a couple of years. And that was our experience in Iran. You know, it took some time for the efforts going after their oil, going after their access to their revenue, for the Iranians to really become serious about negotiations, and frankly, for the effect on the economy in Iran to, to take hold. The same is true with North Korea. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the final point is that sanctions are not a policy. Sanctions are a tool of a broader policy effort. As, as, as Jake was saying, a whole of government effort uh, is, was necessary in Iran. The same is true in North Korea. I think you see some disconnect currently in the administration on this point. You see Secretary Mnuchin, Secretary Mattis, Secretary Tillerson talking about the importance of negotiations, the importance of Im imposing pressure on North Korea to try to induce a negotiation. You have a president who is uh, you know, tweeting that, uh, that all these efforts are futile. I think that policy disconnect is a real problem because sanctions to work need to be embedded in a broader policy construct. And without, that, uh, without there being that broader policy construct, it's just you know, punitive action without any, uh, I think, real prospect of success. I'm going to open up up to questions. Um, I was thinking about, um, but let me start start off by saying um, thank you for for those comments from from all of you. Um, Michael Dobbs, I was thinking about what, um, something from your book where you say communism was not defeated militarily; it was defeated economically, culturally, and ideologically. Um, and it were, and um, I thought of that quote when um, when Jake was also talking about creating the space, and David was also talking about creating the space and creating the leverage. Um, so I wondered if if you think that the idea of maximum pressure and engagement should be should be flipped around, creating the space, or, or um, do you have any thoughts about the sequencing of of you know the types of um, activities that need to be um, undertaken or the conditions that need to be created for um, for for negotiations on anything to happen. Um. Well, from the point of view of someone who did see the communist system collapse in the uh, country of its origin, um, I do think that, um, I mean, this is a larger analysis, but I think the basic reason for the collapse of communism were the internal weaknesses and contradictions in the system itself rather than the uh, pressure that was applied from outside. In fact, I think that the... Cuban Missile Crisis was probably the last moment in the Cold War when um, anybody really thought seriously of the possibility of a military victory over the Soviet Union. And that was, in a way, liberating because it excluded the military solution from the equation. Uh, we had to find other ways to, um, to undermine communism in the Soviet Union, including engagement, which proved uh, over time, of course it took a long time, it's like sanctions, but it took even longer time, um, but um, that proved very effective, um, but you know, it was, took a generation. And um, you know, this was Cannon's strategy back in 1948 with containment, that uh, identifying and gradually exploiting over 
many, many years the weaknesses in the system. Um, and that was the strategy that was finally adopted towards the Soviet Union and I think is the only strategy that has a chance of working with North Korea if you take the military solution uh, off the table. take three at a time as we did last time. So back there, in the middle, and then Trisha. Stanley Roth, still retired. Two questions, one for the, one for the panelists. Um, I think all of you mentioned possibilities with some skepticism about three-party negotiations and who's on what side. But I don't think, and I could be wrong, any of you mentioned South Korea. Can one really have negotiations on the fate of South Korea without South Korea on the table? Second question, a little unusual, is for the moderator. Going back to the last panel, who is Kim Jong-un? You know, we didn't talk about the, some of the lesser sanctions that strike me as quite interesting, meaning the international isolation, closing of embassies, sending home of workers, shutting down small trade in a lot of different countries. I'm not sure if any of the North Korean restaurants have been shut yet, but in other words, it seems the Trump administration is having increasing success in global isolation, detached from the U.S., China, and some of the sanctions that David talked about. How, if at all, does that affect Kim? The fact that there is a more global isolation closer to a pariah regime, does it maybe push him toward negotiations or the opposite, push him to dig in more? Hi, Patricia Kim, Council on Foreign Relations. Um, as Jake mentioned in the panel, the Trump administration's handling of the Iran deal has real implications for dealing with North Korea. So I'd like to ask, how can the U.S. government persuade North Korea and China that any deal we strike, assuming we can get to the table at some point, will be honored by successive um, U.S. administrations? Are there measures that our government can take to restore our credibility as a good negotiating partner? My name is Takahiro Mote. I'm a visiting fellow at CSS Japan team. My question goes to David. You mentioned lastly that sanction took time. I'd like to ask you, how long would it take? Do you think it would work in time before North Korea has the capability to be able to attack here? Thank you. We have, we have four questions. Um, global isolation, uh, the role of South Korea, how to persuade that, that uh, the U.S. is credible if we enter negotiations. And the last one, how long, how long will it take? Uh, let, let me uh, 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 proceed in violent agreement with Stanley Roth that this is, after all, the Korean Peninsula. And in addition, we have the immediate proximity of Japan as a second core American ally. Um, too much of this discussion goes on almost oblivious to this larger context. And very frankly, uh, you're not going to get uh, a credible outcome. How, recognizing the odds on a credible outcome are very, very problematic if you, in some sense, have South Korea absented from this process or Japan. Uh, and I must say, uh, Stanley, that, uh, and, and here speaking to some of the issues were ra raised by the other panelists, one of the, uh, successes, if you will, of uh, the Trump administration has been that whether, whether it's because others are wary of exactly what the United States might do or God knows what, but you, you have all of the, including China increasingly, singing more from a common sheet of music. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, in, in my view at least, uh, you know, I mean, there, there, or there is a, a, a belief to use various kinds of tools, such as sanctions, in a much more active way against North Korea. And that, frankly, uh, I can't, I'm not going to get into the realm of predictions, but I think in a lot of respects, the economic bite on this will, with time, be very, very significant. It's just simply the question of the, the timeline of this relative to the other kinds of things that the United States and others worry about with respect to the operationalization of a nuclear weapons 
uh, capability of a, of a long range. And uh, those, those are the two things. But it does highlight the vulnerabilities that I think are there, but also the protecting of the core equities of American allies, first and foremost, the Republic of Korea. Just on that point, um, you know, when I referred to the unique role of China, I wasn't suggesting there'd be three-party talks between the US, China, and North Korea, only that China joined the same side of the table, in a sense, as the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Americans are on. So of course, Japan and Korea should be central to this. I would, I would note, as an interesting lesson from the, from the Iran talks, is when we were running the secret channel in Oman, we were not consulting with either Israel, our Gulf partners, or for that matter, in a direct way with our other P5 plus one partners. That caused friction over time. It was a challenge for us, and it was a trade-off between being able to ensure discretion and secrecy on the one hand, while on the other hand, recognizing that our important allies and partners had equities that we had to take into account. And of course, we didn't produce a final deal without that consultation, but, um, it was something we were very mindful of. So uh, the point I was trying to make on China has more to do with the unique role they play in this context that was not present in the Iran context. I think if you constituted a P5 plus one today uh, and started an Iran nuclear negotiation, the Russians would actually look more like China does in the North Korea context. They wouldn't just be one of the team um, they would think of themselves having to balance equities vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the United States in a different way. And, and focusing on that dimension for me is quite intriguing. And I'm, I was interested in what Jonathan just said, that, that, that the Chinese approach to this may be shifting more quickly than, than maybe I have perceived so far. On the issue of the interaction or interplay between Iran and the Iran nuclear deal and potential diplomacy with North Korea, I think the premise of the question is very sound, which is, if the United States makes a deal with a nuclear aspirant and says, we're prepared to do certain things if you accept certain restraints, uh, and then walks away from it, it definitely, directly undermines our credibility, both with respect to other nuclear aspirants um, or, or countries seeking to advance their nuclear capabilities, and with our negotiating partners who were asking both to join us at the table and to join us in continuing economic pressure that comes at some cost to them. So there's no doubt in my mind, uh, and it doesn't take leaps of logic to see the ways in which the harm would accrue from walking away from or calling into question the Iranian nuclear deal on any future effort to bring about a stable negotiated solution to the North Korea nuclear question. I would just underscore that there's an even more fundamental issue at play here, which is we have a nuclear crisis that we are spending this morning talking about, the North Korean nuclear crisis. Why would we want to add a second nuclear crisis uh, other than to employ uh, a similar group of think tank people to have a conference maybe tomorrow on how we have terrible options with Iran because we don't have the possibility of a negotiated solution, so what the heck are we going to do? And so I think particularly as we try to grapple with this crisis, raising questions about our staying power with respect to the Iran deal is, is not, it doesn't just defy strategic logic, it defies simple common sense. So let me try and tie together three different questions into, into one answer, which is that the, um, the North Korean economy is vulnerable. So I mean, Jake made the point that one of the advantages we had in the Iran context was Iran was out in the world. And so there were a lot of places where we could squeeze the Iranians in various ways, and we took advantage of that. Um, took a lot of work, a lot of travel around the world. Uh, but we got the, you know, the Indians and the South Koreans and, and the Europeans on board, what have you. North Korea is quite different. It's, it is obviously highly concentrated in China. Um, but there are also these other places around the world. And this gets to the question of, of the, this pressure campaign that, the, that, frankly, the Trump administration has continued what we were doing in the Obama administration, I think is really important, is to go out and to cut off these little, these little fountains of funds that go back to North Korea. They are important because the North Korean economy is so small and Kim Jong-un's need for foreign currency is so intense. He needs foreign currency to buy what they need to import and to buy off the elites. 
he can't use the Korean won, the North Korean won, to buy anything. He needs foreign currency. And so if you go after their ability to earn foreign currency overseas, including you know, through what they do in their embassies to essentially run little mini uh, you know, trading posts out of their embassies, it makes a difference back in North Korea. So there is, there is a vulnerability in the, in the North Korean economy that we can target both with these broad-based sanctions, but also on these more uh, targeted sanctions and going after their financial networks around the world. Um, related to that, though, is the, po so the point that Jake was just making. We need our allies to work with us on, on this effort. We need China in particular, but we need others around the world the same as we needed them in, in the Iran context. For them to do that, they need to bear cost. It is, it is painful in some respect, particularly for China, to change its approach to North Korea and to put pressure on the North Koreans. If they wanted to do it, if it was painless, they would have done it a long time ago. Um, to get the Chinese on board with this, in the same way we got the international community on board with Iran, we, needed, we need to be able to tell them that there is a better outcome, that, there is, that we are actually serious about a negotiated resolution here. If they don't believe that, the Chinese in particular don't believe that we're interested in negotiation in North Korea, it's going to be that much harder to get them to bear the cost of putting pressure on the North Koreans. And, and that's, that is one of the real dangers of backing out of the... Iran deal is that we will be unable to credibly tell the Chinese and others around the world that they should bear this cost because we are actually interested in a non-military solution to the North Korean nuclear problem. Uh, I'm Bob Einhorn from Brookings. Um, as Jake and David have pointed out, the Obama administration succeeded in imposing devastating economic sanctions against Iran. That provided great leverage for the uh, Iran nuclear deal, but apparently not sufficient leverage uh, to achieve U.S. maximum negotiating goals including in particular a complete ban on uranium enrichment uh, in Iran. And the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, has um, a, a wide range of compromises. I think they were necessary compromises uh, to make, um, but, um, but, but compromises. Uh, now, uh, David has pointed out how uh, the Trump administration has succeeded in ramping up pressures against North Korea, and I agree, they're very, very impressive and potentially uh, important tools, uh, and this will provide more leverage. But how much leverage to achieve what objectives in the negotiation? Uh, the, current, um, the current objective is to put irresistible pressure on North Korea to the point where uh, Kim Jong-un agrees to abandon his nuclear and missile programs completely and in the near future. Uh, is that achievable? I don't think that's achievable. And if it's not achievable with all the leverage we're able to amass, what, you know, uh, sh should, should we fall back uh, to, uh, you know, interim limits, a phased approach to denuclearization, or is that too politically risky and we should simply fall back to a long-term strategy of deterrence, pressure, and containment. Thank you. It was very interesting. Um, could it be said that um, uh, I'm a student? Um, <laughs> um, could it be said that Israel pre-67, where it was very economically weak, um, could be comparable to North Korea for uh, it got its, nu uh, its nuclear weapons and was able to hold itself back even through conventional means, but still had the backbone of those nuclear weapons, and it succeeded. So the North Koreans could also make that bet. Alex Augustine, uh, I have a question regarding 
we talked about with the sanctions program a not insignificant uh, aspect of the program is the hope that the effect on the populace will be to foment unrest uh, with the government. We talked about that in the context of Iran, and also hopefully that may or may not work in North Korea, given the recent uh, EO concerning a much broader-based uh, sanctions program. But with Korea, I'm curious, because North Korea emphasizes uh, this enmity with the United States, and that's something that's built into the culture of North Korea and the North Korean populace, that, you know, the, North, that the United States is the enemy, North Korea is a victim of the United States aggression, um, and because the regime controls so much of the information that the population has access to, how do you think that affects the effectiveness of a potential sanctions program uh, in North Korea in, the res in that regard? Um, North Korea likes to gather enemies. They have many enemies. The United States is only one of them. In fact, at the present time, the only major power with whom North Korea interacts on any kind of semi-regular basis is Russia. Uh, they're not dealing with China. They certainly are dealing with the United States on any kind of a credible, uh, credible basis. Uh, and Japan's relations, although Abe at different times has flirted with the idea of trying to resume the return of the other abductees. Uh, that's pretty much shut down right now because of all of North Korea's missile and nuclear activity uh, and direct threats to Japan. Um, and of course, then there's South Korea that frankly the North Koreans have stiffed uh, despite their incentives to do it otherwise. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, an, it's an odd juxtaposition, but granted, uh, naming the United States as, as a primary adversary, I, I get that. That's been a sustaining element uh, in North Korea for from their very origins. It's a threat-based system. But, you know, I think that the, the, the pressures here uh, come from multiple channels. I mean, because there, there's the question of, are they really, in, in essence, shutting themselves off from a whole variety of perspective relationships or because of their own wariness. I mean, very frankly, the North Koreans have openly now, in very authoritative ways, begun to talk about China as an enemy. Uh, and let's not lose sight of that. North Korean nationalism is extraordinarily intense, uh, it, and it's certainly well-practiced over the, over, the, over the decades. And so that's kind of where we are at. If I could turn just to, to Bob's question very, very quickly. Um, Bob, it is my reluctant conclusion that, you know, where we will be, frankly, uh, in a way not unlike what George Kennan talked about a long time ago, uh, is in a long-term containment and deterrence policy versus vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. I'm not trying to compare North Korea per se as a system. Uh, it, it, it is remarkable in its own right, just given how what what a modest uh, society or, or regime we're, we're talking about here. But I think that that's what we have to keep our eye on that ball. Uh, it doesn't mean that in some contexts we wouldn't talk to North Korea, but I think that um, the first and foremost goal has to be a strategy of inhibition, by all means practicable, but short of the onset of war. Uh, now, how you juggle that uh, and how people estimate that um, may vary a great deal, but uh, I think that those are realistic and achievable goals. It's not a solution, or it's certainly not a near-term solution, but it's a very, very necessary way in which I think the United States has to protect not only its own interests, but the interests of its core allies in the region. Just on, uh, Bob, your question really hits you know, it's where the rubber meets the road. And going back to the Iran context, which, of course, Bob knows well because he was uh, a critical part of the, the early phases of those negotiations, we had the benefit, uh, when you think about the clocks, the capability clock of Iran versus the sanctions clock of the United States, to have advanced the sanctions clock to the point where there was enormous pressure on Iran before their capability clock had reached a truly critical juncture. I think part of that is because they slow walk their program for the reasons that I said, um, whereas North Korea has been racing forward pell-mell. 
And that meant that we could, in fact, do something which in the North Korea context is often maligned, and that is get a freeze. I mean, if effectively what we did for a year and a half um, from essentially November of 2013 until July of 2015 was an interim agreement that was essentially stop things in time and then you can get to those compromises that you ultimately talk about. That only worked because we could freeze the Iranian program because we brought enough pressure to bear at a point that we felt we could manage. The problem in the North Korea context is everything that David has talked about is going to take considerably more time and these in the race between these two clocks, it seems very difficult to see how you amass enough pressure to produce the freeze, to produce whatever the, the compromises are over time, that, that that basic equation doesn't line up as nicely in the North Korea context as it worked <coughs> in the Iran context. Um, but nonetheless, I think as an object of our strategy, we still have to work towards that for as long as we can because I neither think that we should decide now is the time to go take some preventive military option, nor do I believe that we should say um, wherever we end up at the end of the day, today our policy is now just to shift to, you know, essentially a, a form of acquiescence in this capability and then managing it over time. So even though I acknowledge this is not easy to do, I think that basic logic still has to obtain. We still have to build the pressure as fast as we can in an effort to try to change the way in which these two clocks are running. Let me just offer one quick addendum to, to Jake's uh, clocks here. And that is that the, the, and this goes back to the question I didn't ask before about how long it's gonna take. The, the clock on pressure in North Korea can actually accelerate very quickly. Um, both in reality and in perception. Um, the reality will take a little bit longer because just the way economies operate, but if the Chinese were to say clearly, definitively, that they were going to, say, cut off fuel oil, uh, petroleum to North Korea, and they did it, and they, you know, they got a big pipe and they got a, you know, got a handle on it, they turn it, they cut it off, they've done it before, they can do it again. If they were to do that, the, the sort of interorum effect of that in North Korea, I think, would be significant. Even before you see the economic impact roll out, there is, there is such a sort of exquisite vulnerability in North Korea to what China can do that you can accelerate this clock if you get the Chinese on board. Um, that's a, obviously a big if. Um, you know, we've been, you know, as a, as a country, we've been working on that for uh, quite a while. But you know, I think there are some you know green sh green shoots of possibility here uh, that uh, that China may be prepared to do that again if they think that we are serious about a negotiated resolution. If they think that what we're going to do is bomb North Korea and spark a war there, you can forget about China being uh, of any assistance. I think. Just a quick point to follow on on David's observation. One of the vulnerabilities here is that the economy of northeastern China is, let's just not say, a stirring success. Uh, in an ironic way, there is a dependence on trade with North Korea of various kinds of commodities. And again, the Chinese here, I'm not trying to put them on a pedestal, but the decisions that they have at least announced and things they have agreed to through the Security Council resolutions and through statements of their own um, suggest to me that they are more prepared than in the past to bear these costs. I think that the other thing that bears some consideration is the Chinese, of course, are on the cusp of the 19th Party Congress, as I don't have to remind my uh, good colleague uh, Chung Li uh, out in the audience. Um, we'll, let's see also what outcomes come out of that process as well. Uh, it's not to think fancifully about this, but it's it just in a very ironic kind of way, China has a vulnerability here that we tend not to weigh just simply because China seems to have this disproportionate role in the, in the North Korean economy. One, one final thing, if I could, um, let us pay attention to Russia. Uh, it represents the possibility of a get out of jail free card. Uh, and there's been movement here by the Russians. They're trying to reactivate a whole variety of relationships that could lead to some 
clever strategies that will still find North Korean resources getting out, finding their way maybe even to China and other places still. So I'm not putting, you know, kind of uh, unconditional faith in the honoring of, uh, of the agreements that are there. But, um, but Russia, whether diplomatically or otherwise, is a potential wild card in this situation right now. Yeah, very briefly to expand on my earlier answers. Um, of course, we're preoccupied with the you know, short-term crisis and um, short-term solutions. But uh, we need not to lose sight of two things. One is the risk of uncontrollable escalation. We have to think about that and think how we're going to deal with that. That's the most worrying concern to me. I think we're in a fa uh, 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 perhaps not quite as dangerous as the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we're fast approaching um, that kind of risk. And secondly, uh, I think we need to think longer term. We need to think, um, think about devising the kind of policies that ultimately enable the West to defeat Soviet totalitarianism. And uh, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, it's going to take decades, generations, but we should be uh, investing some thought, as much thought into that as uh, to dealing with the short-term crisis. Speaking of the clock and the time, it's time for lunch. Um, please join me in thanking my esteemed colleagues and panelists over here. Thank you.